Well, it was 27 years ago we first came to Australia and just people did, they couldn't even spell Buddhism, let alone know what Buddhism was. So imagine like going around the streets dressed like this. But you've got some really good stairs, but it's a great advertisement. You know, like uh, they couldn't sort of ignore you dressed like this. But it was tough at first because we didn't have any money, we didn't have a place to stay, so it was very tough. A little bit of for when people got to trust you. That was the most important thing because they checked you out for the first couple of years, knew you were sort of real monks, you were practicing uh, well, you were simple, and you were teaching good things, being kind, and those were sorts of things which inspired people to say, yeah, we want these monks to survive, so they supported us. So we managed to build up a strong community over the years. My ordained name is Hasa Panya. So Hasa means joyous, Panya means wisdom. So my name is Joyous Wisdom. I learned a lot and I never thought that being a nun, I have to learn lots of things. You know, how to use chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> with the water system and how to fix the drain and digging trenches and things like that because when you live in the forest so we have to learn a lot of skills to be to be able to live in the forest but I find that it's really good like uh, lots of experience lots of things that we thought that only man can do it but and actually we can do it too <laughs> you know Lots of time we always think that we can't. So when we think that we can't, we can't. So, but because of we are living in the forest and because we are the nun communities, so we, we have to be independent and then we have to learn to do things ourselves. Today is a special celebration from Ajahn Prime's 60th birthday. Thank you to Ajahn. Beautiful heart and beautiful mind. It's very nice to have my big brother visit me from uh, England for the first time. It's about time you come here, big brother. After many times I visited you, and this is the first time you come to visit me. But nevertheless, I have put on a big party. It's not my birthday party. It's welcoming my big brother from UK. So welcome to this humble place. As you see, I live a very simple life. <laughs> With lots of solitude and peace. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's very nice to see you here on my 60th birthday. And I forgive you publicly for all those times you beat me up when I was a kid. <laughs> so what is your reflections coming to a Buddhist monastery for the first time? My reflections are how busy it is and how many people are here and how well regarded you are. Buddhism is growing in the Western world and so am I. See that? <laughs> Very good. Humour, that was you know, part of my upbringing. My father came from Liverpool. If you haven't got a sense of humour in Liverpool, you don't survive. But it's also just part of who you are. It's just being normal, being human, being even though you're a monk, and sometimes people think that that's this huge spiritual advanced being who you can't get close to. Humour is something which draws people together. When you laugh, everybody laughs, and that means that everybody is part of you. Sometimes you have a nice breakfast like this, meet your old friends, hear a few funny stories from a Buddhist monk, which is quite rare these days, and then you go home, and on the way home, you tread in the dog shit. <laughs> now there's one thing, I must tell you, if you do tread in the dog shit, please, 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 don't scrape it off your shoes. Take it home with you, and don't, 
Don't scrape it off until it's under your mango tree or under your apple tree. Because you find out if you scrape it off under your apple tree or mango tree, one year later your mangoes will be sweeter and juicier than ever before. But remember, when you eat that mango, you must remember what you're really eating. <laughs> It's dog shit, but it's been transformed into juicy mango. And now, now you understand what that simile means. Now we do get the cancers in life, we do get the difficulties, the problems in life, but who knows? If you know how to make use of that, you can make beautiful mango juice out of the smelliest of dog, dog shit. When there are those problems in life, our oh, people keep sort of coming to see us. And there's also, because it's a range retreat and we don't travel, unfortunately these days we've got emails and we've got telephones. So now we do have the Dial a Nun counselling service. And so we want to soon have a Dial a Nun counselling service once we build up the Hasalas <laughs> once again. Well, I was in Hong Kong recently. After I left, one of the nuns who at the temple said, thank you for coming. Before you came, I was not allowed to laugh. Every time I smiled, people said, no, Buddhists aren't supposed to do that. When you came here and smiled and everyone was happy, now I can smile as well. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. So it's a beautiful, compassionate thing to do, to make people happy. And much of humor is about a truth, about you know, the human condition of what we are and just how stupid we are sometimes. <laughs> That's why people laugh, because when we laugh, we're laughing at ourselves. Bring over some dim sums. <laughs> Please. Yeah, this is a message for everybody in Hong Kong. Bring over some real dim sums. <laughs> Underneath us, we're still big kids at Bodhinyana Monastery. And so we have a lot of fun. And isn't that important in life? Doesn't matter how old you are or how senior you are, remember play is important. When play, when you're not allowing your mind to go in one direction, you're allowing it to sort of go off into weird directions. And when you experiment that way, you come up with some very interesting new ideas. So play is really important. So because I'm very, very playful, yeah, I get in trouble sometimes, but you also have a lot of innovation happens as well. It's how we experiment. So in your life, don't be so serious. My ordained name is Venerable Niroda, and here in Australia we use Venerable for a fully ordained nun, a bhikkhuni. I arrived in January 2001, so I'm here now over 10 years. Together with Venerable Hasapanna, we, for the time being, are co abbots and we're both of us taking uh, care of the monastery, and I'm very happy to say both of us work together in a very harmonious way. And, uh, and we do hope that it's for the benefit of all beings, including ourselves. We are trying our best. We are trying to establish something quite unique for women to uh, be able to lead uh, or experience monastic life. Because uh, in many uh, traditions, in many spiritual uh, endeavors, uh, women are very often disadvantaged. I've got a really nice monastery, so I don't need anything more. Just where I live is very peaceful and wonderful, got lots of support. So you say, why don't you just rest? But no, you can't rest when there's something missing, when there's some portion of our community which are not being treated fairly. And of course, in spirituality, that's women, half the population. What about the rest of humanity, the other half, the females? Why can't they have exactly the same? The wonderful thing is that in original Buddhism there was that equity there. There was the same uh, possibilities for women and men, and somehow we lost that. And in our modern world, it's something which doesn't feel right about that. For most people in Asia, especially in Thailand, for them, being a monk is something very noble. Being a nun is that someone that being old or sick or they are the failure. <laughs> That's why they be, being a nun. But actually, it's not. A lot of uh, the nuns here, they've been highly educated and they have a, a successful career and they come in. Yeah, there's already one goal in the last few years which I've been working on is to have equity between the genders so that uh, to have uh, full ordination for nuns and we've managed to start that off a couple of years ago. It still hasn't got full acceptance yet. 
but uh, certainly if Buddhism is going to survive in our modern world, in the West and in the East, you know, we have to um, make sure that there is uh, equity, which is just basic respect. That's as it was in the time of the Buddha. Female monastics getting as much support, reaching the very heights of spiritual attainments, so there will be hardly any difference between the, the nuns and the monks. Equal respect. Having the monastery here because we're independent, so we are not dependent on the monks. And by having a nuns monastery, actually it's, uh, it gives a lot of uh, confidence to a lot of uh, women. We have some women come here and they can see that yes, you know, actually women can do it. We are not second class. We are as intelligent as a man, but only think that we have to be given the opportunities. We need to give, be given the opportunities to be independent. So this is a very unique undertaking here, and as you know, as you have seen, uh, the land is very, um, it's a very large, large, unique block of land, an area of um, very unique Australian wildlife here. We are wildlife sanctuary in that sense, but we also a sanctuary for women seeking ordination, for women seeking a spiritual life. This is the only um, training monastery, training nuns in this tradition, especially for nuns. Actually, this is the only one. Uh, being a good teacher is, again, being able to not talk down to people, but talk not, not above people, but talk at the same level. You can be honest, you can be upfront, you can teach from the heart, and you can bridge that gap. And the relating Buddhism uh, to people's daily lives, and humour as well. And one of the most important things is, I found in teaching, never planning what you're going to say, but just uh, keeping a kind, peaceful mind, and then relating to people. For example, I gave a talk uh, a couple of nights ago about Buddhism and bananas. But when you have a banana, you usually peel it from the top. And that's a lot of suffering. Sometimes it squashes, sometimes it's hard to open. And the reason is we don't really follow the experts. Who are the experts with bananas? Monkeys. And if you watch how a monkey peels a banana, it peels it from the bottom. So when you learn how to peel it from the bottom, like the experts do, you have less suffering. And that's like a simile about people come to the, the experts, the monks, they learn how to meditate, they learn how to let go of suffering and pain in life. Because too much in life, it's like we peel the banana at the wrong end. And that's why you have pain and suffering. So you come and learn from the monks, you learn how to peel life at the right end, and then it doesn't get all squashy and squishy. We are just trying to rise to the occasion. So um, it's not that we have, we certainly I feel we're not fostering any ambitions, we don't try to be the best and the biggest, but as it happens out of our karmic um, potential that many good things have come together. They were driving me to see this small piece of land you know, up in the back of Gijigana, 30 acres. But as we pass, we pass this big sign, 600 acres of paradise. And of course I said, let's have a look at it. They said, no, we can't afford that. And unfortunately, you know, I'm not just a spiritual di uh, director of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia, I'm also known as a spiritual dictator. <laughs> so I told them, get inside there, I want to have a look at this place. And of course it was beautiful. You know, that's our present Dhammasara. So I said, let's give it a try. So it was going to be auctioned. And of course, we don't know how much it was going to be. And this gentleman over here, Eddie Fernando, he was a person who was bidding for us. And when we actually saw how much money we had in the kitty, borrowing a bit from there, you know, a, a, another loan, interest-free loan from somebody else, borrowing, when we got everything together, the maximum we could possibly afford, the maximum, and that was really stretching it, was 600,000. We knew that was going to be very difficult. So, I got there early with a few monks. And my goodness, did I do some heavy chanting. <laughs> Really heavy stuff. <laughs> and then when they did the bidding, the auction, it was really exciting. And they started bidding. And it went up to, I think, Eddie, he put his hand up for 600,000. I'll give it. 
And I was using all the powers of my mind <laughs> to try and keep people's mouths shut. <laughs> and then someone put their hand up and said, 6.25. Oh, we'd lost it. No, we, we're over the top, we can't afford that. And this man, Eddie, put his hand up and said 6.50. <laughs> and our treasurer, he was going apoplectic, he went red. Steam was coming out of his ears. He can't do that. <laughs> and of course he did, it was too late. The soda was brought for 6.50. Because Eddie Fernando over here did not follow instructions. Thank you, Eddie. <laughs> This is where it all started, about, uh, I think, 12 years ago, uh, when Ajahn Vahema was uh, residing here all by herself. Mm -hmm. So she was staying in the caravan over there. Mm -hmm. And this is a shed where the lay people come and offer food uh, every day. Mm -hmm. And uh, she will give a Dhamma talk every day to whoever comes. Sometimes it's just a single person come here, she'll mm -hmm. still give a talk. Now we, we've got sort of an idea, let's start a nice monastery. All of these things is totally on faith. Ridiculous ideas. How can you get enough money, enough land to get sort of another monastery? We've only got one. Isn't that enough? One of the biggest things which happened for our nuns monastery was when I received a call and it was this Australian Caucasian man lived over in Fremantle. He wanted to do something for his daughter. His wife had just given birth to their first child, who was a daughter. And he had heard that we were raising funds to buy land for our nuns' monastery. And he came to see me and said, I want to make a donation to your nuns' monastery out of gratitude for having my first child, a daughter. So I don't know if my daughter would ever want to become a nun, but in case she does, I want a place where she can do that if she wants to. So he wrote out a check, $250,000. Even me, my head was shaking. <laughs> 250000 And he was an ordinary man, I never saw him again. So it's amazing, that type of generosity, it was like coming totally out of the blue. That's what actually makes these things happen. It's difficult to get all these buildings going on, but we just think, don't think of how long it's going to take. We're just going to say, yeah, we're going to do this. And just like our, our Jhana Grove retreat centre, that was the same. You know, people are thinking, no, look, we can't afford this. It's too big, it's too much. You know, a few million dollars, where are we going to get that from? But you keep on trying, you keep on going. And little by little, Amazing people come along. There are many aspects of this uniqueness of the place. First of all, we are a part of Australia where Buddhism is very esteemed and where Buddhism is very well respected. And we have, uh, as you can see, uh, multicultural people coming here. And it's very, from my own experience, very unique that we all live together in great harmony, actually practicing kindness. Uh, community here, especially the lay uh, supporters, and uh, really very supportive, and uh, really, you know, it couldn't be better. <laughs> it's uh, really supportive of the nuns here. Because we have, uh, as you can see, people from all backgrounds, from all nations, from many nations come here, we're able to talk to them. We're able to talk to them from our own background, but also by uh, getting to know everyone better, but getting to know ourselves better. Because when I just came here, I, I couldn't understand, you know, like because different culture, different background, and sometimes I, I at the beginning I just couldn't get my head around, <laughs> you know. But after a while, I tend to like open up myself, and actually it's helped me to become more compassionate and becomes a, a kinder person. One of the nice things about our Buddhist study is that real people, real monks, real nuns, you can actually come and see them, talk to them, you know, share jokes with them. This place we're standing at now, this is our monastery, and this is, we have, uh, we'll have about 20 monks here soon. 
And this is a place, this is our home. In order to make sure that we look after the lake community, we've got the big center over in Nolamara, but we need places where people can meditate and be quiet, so we have the meditation retreat center as well. And that's incredibly popular uh, because we've made it comfortable for people. So meditation is not some like going to the dentist, which you have to be afraid of, but you've got to do anyway, so you grit your teeth and think, I'd better go on meditation retreat. That's no, something you like doing, because it's comfortable. One of the most important things is sincerity because uh, so many people have lost their faith in institutions, in governments, in police, even teachers, and in churches as well. But you know, we've, for the last 27 years we've been here, we've had an impeccable record. And that's one of the wonderful things we've been able to achieve, uh, simply because we've been so open. We are taking care, we're taking care of the land, we're taking care also in a way of future generations. But by the same token, we only can do what is possible. Just a simple life and a life of integrity. We don't have lots of material things. So we are teaching by example. And is this possible? And this kind of happiness, this is the happiness of peace, happiness of calm. Only by being calm, peaceful, only the inner peace and the calmness leads to contentment. Actually, contentment is the greatest wealth. If the female Sangha is well established, I feel they have an important role to play for society and also for, uh, for the Sangha at large. I cannot explain in words, but the ordination for me has made a very big difference. And I will always honor that. And I know it has, uh, will always honor and respect and with gratitude to all the people, monks and nuns, who have been uh, involved in making this possible. And therefore, it's very important that we have a um, so-called international monastery here, where people from many backgrounds, people from many nations can come and practice together. Once you start on a spiritual path, um, east and west, in the end, falls away. And as Venerable Hasapana mentioned, we all have to then open up to uh, other people's doing, how, how, how they are, how they function, but underneath of it all, we will experience in our own heart, in our own minds, the same humanness. Now, at the end of our life, what have we done really inspiring, really good? Building places for monasteries, building Buddhist centers, places where people could go and meditate at our jhana grove. These are great things which we've all achieved. That's what a society is. People have come together for a beautiful cause and we make it happen when we had the scale model for our retreat centre. A lot of people said, oh, that's just a dream. We never raise enough money for that. And now you go there and it's there. It's reality. In a few years' time, you remember this evening. You remember when the Sala complex at Dharmasala Monastery was just a, a model, a small model, which can fit in the back of your car. And then you'll see it, reality beautiful complex set where people can go and meditate with the nuns. They can stay overnight. They can just relax and be refreshed. It's a resource, a beautiful resource for you and for everybody else. So that's why we're doing these things. To inspire, to do something very meaningful for our society. Certainly I'm very grateful to our donors and we hope that they also can come and, um, and visit us and uh, enjoy and see uh, through their generosity what has been made possible for the benefit of so many people. So the nine monastery here may be your daughter, your granddaughter, your great-great-granddaughter. They might not want to become a nun, but 
if they want to become a nun, there is a nun monastery here in Western Australia. So that is benefit many, many more future gen generations to come. So this is our future. Dhammasara future is our future. So the prosperity of the Dhammasara nuns monastery is depends on all of us. I've been a, a preceptor for many years now and it's always one of the great joyful things to uh, ordain uh, young people and to uh, see them become novices and then monks and especially uh, to see them starting to giving their first talks when they were monks. To come here and you see good news. You see beautiful people doing beautiful things, spreading peace, kindness, simplicity in our world. And becoming a monk is an, is an example of that. Uh, now as an example of how we can indeed share and spread goodness in our way. But it's a wonderful thing that you see here that these are your uh, monks and your nuns and you see them when they're just working in the kitchens of Dhammasava and they're working in the kitchens of uh, Bodhinyana. You see them as Anagamakas, then you see them becoming novices, then you see them becoming monks and then you see them giving their first talks and these are your monks. You very, very proud of you. Well, it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to be president this year, the year of Ajahn Brahm's 60th birthday. And what a day it is too, and what excitement and pleasure that we've all had in leading up to it, just preparing for this day. For those of us that have been working over the last couple of years, and you know the trials and tribulations that Ajahn Brahm in particular has had, um, along with uh, the ordination of the nuns and so on, it's particularly gratifying really to have uh, had you here, sir, to, uh, to present this statue today. Quite a wonderful thing for uh, the, the King of Thailand to permit such a statue to come uh, to the Bodhinyana Modern Monastery. Um, and I'm sure that Ajahn Brahm feels very, very uh, good about that too. Bodhiyan Monastery, several times, Western Australia, and in particularly the most venerable Ajahn Brahm, has been instrumental in bringing the Dharma and propagation of Buddhism to this vast continent. In respect of this noble undertaking, the World Fellowship of Buddhists hereby present and respectfully engage one Prasasada Buddha image to the Bodhiyana Monastery several times. May I also take this opportunity to congratulate the most venerable Prajan Ram as attaining his 60th birthday anniversary and 37 years of ordain and propagation of the Dharma. Well, I'm just going to start the, the song. <laughs> join, in, join in with me, uh, I'd appreciate that. So, thank you. Hope everyone has a wonderful day and make peace, be kind, be gentle and please smile a lot. <laughs>